Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. My name is Gita Mary and today we're going to talk about the impact of having children as well as the overpopulation myth. This is something that often strikes a nerve with a lot of people and understandably so. I've talked a bit about it on Instagram very briefly and I actually said that I didn't want to make a video about this but alas now here we are, girl changed her mind. I wanted to make a video about this. Anyway, I want to use my platform not only to inspire and motivate sustainable change, how we can lower our impact, how we can become more conscious consumers. I also want to use my platform to talk about what happens within our movement, to create a space that is healthy and critical of things that goes around in the world, as well as things that goes around inside the community, like the movement of sustainability and environmentalism. And this is definitely one of those subjects where a lot of things are happening happening outside the movement, but a lot of things are also happening inside the movement and I think it's really important that we talk about them. I often encounter comments and remarks about how it's hypocritical to have kids or wanting to have kids while also being an environmentalist, how having children is the most unsustainable thing you can do. It's incredibly impactful to have children overall. It's something that I've read in countless articles and I've heard the same talking points being repeated over and over again, even from people with good intentions that are well-meaning. And one of the first pages that popped up when I searched online for articles about the impact of having children had this to say. It's true that around the world, people are making serious efforts to reduce consumption and environmental degradation. More power to them. But to have a fighting chance to starve off the worst effects of global climate change, we need to seriously address the problem of overpopulation. The potential savings from reduced reproduction are huge compared to the savings that can be achieved by changes in lifestyle. If the climate is changing as a result of global warming, and if global warming is largely attributable to human activity, and if that human activity has included polluting the atmosphere with greenhouse gases and overconsuming natural resources by an ever-increasing population, why not connect the dots and accept the obvious? Overpopulation is not just a contributor to climate change but it's a root cause of the problem. First of all, just a little bit of an overview. Thoughts and concerns about overpopulation is actually much older than thoughts and concerns about global warming and climate change. Already in the 1700s, the first essay started circulating about the potential consequences and effects of an ever-increasing population. And in 1968, the population bomb was published. In 1983, the former prime minister of Norway identified in a report that richer countries decreasing birth rates and economically supporting poorer countries instead was a key mechanism in stopping unsustainable population growth. But global warming isn't caused by people just existing. It's caused by burning fossil fuels. When oil and coal and other types of fossil fuels are burnt, the carbon in them combines with the oxygen in the atmosphere and creates carbon dioxide. Or CO2. And around the same time as the principle of population was published, the Industrial Revolution was starting out. Improvement to the steam engine was made in 1781, providing more energy to industry. In 1861, Siemens built the first coal generator. In 1885, Benz developed the first internal combustion gasoline-powered car. In 1908, Ford made it widely accessible to the population. And all of these steps has led to global warming, and the industry has always known. Already in the 1800s, scientific studies were created that showed the effects of burning fossil fuels and how it affected temperature change. And yeah, more people means more consumption means more fossil fuels being burned. So far, so good. So why is overpopulation a myth? Well, first of all, because the size of a demographic or the size of a population is no longer directly related to how high their emissions are. Currently, the emissions of the richest 1% in the world is more than double of what the emissions are for the poorest 50%. So, and whenever we talk about there being too many people, whenever someone mentions population control, etc., it's never. It is never those 1% that we're talking about. It is, however, most often, the poorest 50%, the most vulnerable in our population. To put it shortly, whenever we blame population growth for climate change and for global warming, what we're really just doing is that we are redirecting the blame to those who have the least power to change it. The consumption of the richest people in the world is much more impactful than any population numbers. And I could literally stop the video right there, but um, I'm not going to. Also, I think it's incredibly funny that whenever I criticize billionaires, the elite, the richest 1%, etc., that's when I receive the most criticism or the most backlash. Even though 
they're literally to blame for all our issues. It's just funny to me that so many of us are so willing to defend them when they are not willing to help us at all. And it's been proven that even if our population increases, we would still have plenty of resources, plenty of space, plenty of food for everybody if we just moderated our consumption and phased out fossil fuels. Here I'm obviously both talking about everybody with a consumer power with the ability to change as well as the richest 1%. 100 companies and government-owned entities has been responsible for 71% of all global emissions since the 80s. Yet we often prescribe population growth to be the biggest climate contributor, bigger than the impact of billion dollar corporations and that is just in fact untrue. The ideology of too many people often tends to shift the focus completely away from who's in power, who is structuring our economy and who is holding our resources. And one thing that I think is incredibly interesting about the too many people ideology is that it's often represented or communicated as though it's incredibly easy to figure out exactly what the impact of one person is. And as we'll come to see in this video, that is incredibly complex. One equation that can be used here is the IPAT equation or the IPAT equation, which stands for impact equals population, affluence, technology. Affluence is the gross domestic product per capita and technology is the measure of the amount of resources required to produce a unit of gross domestic product. And since the 2000s, UN reports have shown how global resource use is driven primarily by increase in affluence, not population, especially so in higher, upper and middle class nations, which account for 78% of material consumption in the world, despite having slower population rates. In the meantime, low income countries have seen a double in population, whereas resource consumption has stayed the same. To put it simply and in English, it's not about who or how many spends resources, it's how much we spend. And one really good example of that is the food we eat. We actually have plenty of arable land to produce food for an entire population, even with a dramatic increase of people. What we don't have is the capacity to produce all types of food, but definitely some types. This graph shows the land use for different types of food products. So producing especially beef and lamb requires an immense amount of land. Land that could be converted into plant-based farming, which could feed a lot more people. In this case, getting protein from peas and nuts and oats could seriously save some space. Livestock currently takes up 26% of the planet's habitable land. And the thing is, during these next years, less and less land will become habitable due to rising temperatures and climate change, etc. This means that we will see a large number of climate refugees needing to relocate. But still, overpopulation is actually not an issue, not when there is technically plenty of space for all these people if we consumed in moderation and changed our behavior. What we're actually saying when we blame overpopulation for climate change is that we would much rather police other people's families than buy less things, eat less meat, etc. One study that I see being referenced over and over again by articles stating that the most unsustainable thing you can do is have a child is this study from 2017. It specifically states that having one less child will result in a saving of CO2 of almost 60 tons, thus making it the most effective climate action an individual can take. However, your girl has some issues with this study. First and foremost, because the study doesn't take policy change into account. So the estimate that they come up with, the amount of CO2 that you can approximately say from not having a child is misleading and also incorrect. Looking through this study, their methods and how they communicate their results, I had a lot of questions and specifically about how they come up with the numbers for the specific actions. I also took a look at some of the graphs that they used in their study and the more you look at them, the less sense they honestly make. This is how they specifically describe their approach. For the action have one fewer child, we relied on a study that quantified future emissions of descendants based on historical rates, based on heredity. In this approach, half of a child's emissions are assigned to each parent, as well as one quarter of that child's offspring, the grandchildren, and so forth. There are several problems with their approach overall. Firstly, it's incredibly difficult to predict impact of future people. 
it's a very complex equation with a million different variations. So because it's really difficult to predict the future, instead we're looking to the past, the impact of people in the past, the policies that's been in place in certain demographics and areas in the past, and using that as a base for future generations. However, that's never going to give you any realistic results regarding the actual impact of people. Also, according to this logic, the impact of my decision to have a child I will then have to take into account all the generations that will come after me and put that into my specific carbon footprint. How does that work exactly? And the funny thing is, it's not really being done with any of the other individual actions. <laughs> also, another thing I think is interesting in this study, it's presented as though the impact of children will always be the same. It's a static impact, it's a constant. And it really, really, really isn't. Children do not bear the same inherent impact. It all depends on their network, on where they are born, on the lifestyle of their parents and everything, everything. It has to do with demographic and tradition and culture and diet and everything. Technology available, what kind of government is currently functioning, everything everything. So the impact of children is not static. It depends on a million different variables. And also trying to account for that child's future children, all hypothetical children that might come from that bloodline, seems like a very unreliable equation. The impact of people is not static. Different people have different lifestyles and different impacts. As such, if you're living a conscious, plant-based, buy-nothing-new, fly-free, car-free, mending your own clothes, boycotting fast fashion, thrift shopping, growing your own vegetables, repairing your own electronics type of lifestyle, then you're not gonna save almost 60 tons of CO2 by not having a child. You're not. <laughs> I guess my point is that that number is mostly guesswork and that number specifically is being repeated in so many articles. It's being referenced constantly and everywhere. And I really doubt that any of those people writing those articles even bothered to look at where that number really came from. Or maybe they just don't care. I don't know. I care. <laughs> Another study that gives a slightly more nuanced insight into the impact of population growth is this one by Founders Pledge. This study accounts for policy changes that are already and will even more so in the future decrease our individual footprint because the systems around us will become more sustainable. One of the conclusions of this study is that the impact of a person largely depends on where that person lives, aka how many green policies and sustainable initiatives they have accessible to them. For instance, a person in France generates an average of 7 tons of CO2 in a year, while a person in the US generates about 18 tons of CO2 in a year. And that both takes lifestyle differences into account as well as government policies and all sustainable initiatives that are available, which obviously makes the impact of a person vary. Also, the too many people ideology is deeply rooted in racism. Actually, the writer of the book previously mentioned, The Population Bomb, found his inspiration to write his book after visiting a crowded city in India. And the subject of population control and the too many people ideology is most often than not directed towards non-white people. Whenever someone talks about there being too many people, it's often China, India, the entire continent of Africa that's being brought up. And both historically and more recently speaking as well, it's also people of color that's been victims to attacks of ecofascism and forced sterilization. Despite the fact that on average, these demographics have a much lower carbon footprint than the average white American or white European. We're currently at a time right now where so many forces are doing everything they can to govern people's bodies, where basic autonomy is taken from so many people. As such, I think it's incredibly important that the movement of sustainability, the movement of environmentalism does everything it can to distance itself from a discourse, from a narrative that dictates what other people do with their own bodies. So repeating half true, half well, yeah, kinda, but there's really more to the story type of talking points is not only unhelpful to the movement, it's a huge disservice and it's also unethical. But there are already so many children in the world that needs a family, so why would you want biological children when you could just adopt instead? Now, I don't have a lot of personal experience in this field, so this is just what I've read, heard, seen been told, etc. Um, the adoption industry is a little bit of an industry, at least there are many different variations of adoption and some are definitely more ethical than others, at least it's not guaranteed that it's transparent throughout 
inherently. So I would just say that adoption is still an option. It's not an option for everybody. And deciding that everybody should just adopt instead of having biological children is also governing people's bodies. It can be a great option. It might not be for everybody. That's all I know, okay? As a conclusion, it's completely up to you if you want children or not. And you can still be an environmentalist even if you have children. If you want to live child-free, that's amazing. If you want children, that's amazing. I guess the most important thing we can do is to navigate this world as consciously, as sustainably as we possibly can. And having children does not make that impossible. Overall, I think it's very important to not let our understanding of environmentalism rest on one single thing. Sustainability is an incredibly complex thing. It's made up of many, many, many different issues. And simply saying that if you want children or if you have children, you cannot participate in sustainability in environmentalism is simply just wrong. I have gotten comments from people that's been shamed for having children in environmentalism. And I've gotten comments from people that are scared to start a family because they fear the reactions from their communities. So it's already incredibly scary and intimidating to bring a child into the world, especially this world. And I don't think there are anyone that cares about the planet that hasn't thought about that more than the, what's probably good for them. So there's really no need to shame them or tell them or to make them aware. I feel like, I feel like they know. I feel like they probably know. So before we jump on the bandwagon of shaming new parents for the impact of their kids and their great, 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 great grandkids, I think it's important to look towards our own habits, sort of what are we supporting? What kind of products are we consuming? What are we voting for? Who are we supporting? And look at how we can better ourselves, look at how we can lower our own emissions and then trust that new parents and their children are doing the same. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any thoughts, feedback or anything you want to share or add to the things I've said, leave them down below. But please remember, this is an incredibly subjective thing. So just bear that in mind. Also, this is a topic that makes a lot of people very emotional. Respect that, please, in the comments. That's all I'm asking for. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day and I will see you guys next time. Take really good care of yourselves. Until then, bye. Thank you so much for watching this video and also a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys help me create green zero waste contents and I love you guys. You can find the links to my social media accounts down below and the link to my Patreon on this screen. Bye!